What is up, Rotor Grinders? Welcome back to the Morning Grind. This is Dean still. It's not Stevie. Stevie, of course, is still, still busy knocking out his NASCAR content. You guys know where to get it here at rotorgrinders.com. Uh, that said, not a ton of major sports going on just yet. Actually, my guest might take umbrage with that in a second. Uh, but uh, with that said, we have been doing a, an interview series at the FS Personality Series. Uh, and with that, I'm going to bring in, uh, I don't know how to give the best introduction here, the DFS Thought Leader. Uh, formerly the man's. I don't know if he's currently the man's. I'm not sure if that's been retired or not. Uh, he was once a thought leader for, for LOL as well, specifically. I think XFL also. They know who it is. It's Peter Oberzet. It's AKA potentially the man's. Are we no longer the man's? Is that retired? You know, it's it's something I haven't really addressed uh, in a while. Man's has been laying low. He hasn't really made uh, any appearances or surfaced of late. You know, there's rumors that he might have gotten the Rona, that his physical crypto stock plummeted. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's hard to know, but yeah, you know, in, in cancel culture, it's probably good that the man's isn't around. <laughs> he canceled himself preeminently. Do we speak about the man's in second person? Is that how this works? Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just talking <laughs> about the man's. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, a lot of times I've been doing this and I know the person, I know him well, a lot of times I do it. I don't know them at all. And I don't know you very well. I know you from Twitter and I was telling you pre-show you, you're amazing at Twitter. You're great at getting the clout. And just before the show, I believe you're tweeting about the, uh, you're getting Shane Battier's attention, who apparently is a fan of the uh, the No RB, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point as well, too. Or you've, if we don't talk about it here, it's all over your Twitter, amongst other things. You're crushing the TikTok life. And I'm an old person, so I don't really know what TikTok is. I'm aware of its existence, but I've yet to get an account just yet. Uh, so what I did, I said, hey, I don't know you that well. Like, I figured a good starting point. I went to your cohorts at the, uh, the Swolecast, and I said, hey, uh, what should I ask uh, the man's about? Or I'm sorry, Peter Ober's that about. My apologies. Oh, now um, I'm actually scared uh, knowing that you crowdsourced it to those guys. <laughs> well, it's funny because uh, two of the three, I think, gave me like an actual like real answer. And one of the three was just taking a shot at you. Oh, throw, throw them under the bus. That's that's all. Devin will attest. All we do on the swole cast is throw each other on the bus. So go for it. I was going to let you guess. To, I'm going to tell you what they said and you tell me who said this. Okay, I can do that. Yeah, uh, so one person said, of course, Davis Maddock, uh, Mr. Tuttle, uh, uh, Kitchen, Soccer Dave, those are the three options. Uh, Pre-COVID, Peter traveled more than literally anyone uh, I know. So ask him uh, about some places to go, how shitty it is not to travel right now when it comes to you know the current situation. That's one person who said that. You know who that, said that? That had to have been Davis. That is, well, should I, I shouldn't answer that because now that would process some explanation. Well, I already know it was Davis, so I'm on, I'm on a roll here. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh you can always ask him uh, just reference his failing TikTok account. Now that could be either, but the brevity of it makes me think it's Tuttle. <laughs> uh, I think the angle uh, of the man's being his first real notable, for what it's worth, notable is in air quotes, by the way. Then that's hilarious. definitely Soccer Dave. Guaranteed <laughs> Soccer Dave. He's always trying to slightly <laughs> undercut me in the nicest way possible. But he's doing it to an audience of one, like just me. It's a nobody else. He just wants to undercut you just to me. Uh, yeah, so the man's being your first real notable uh, thing and asking about uh, conscious efforts he made to get away from that, which, uh, well, that's maybe this. I don't know. <laughs> and this is this is my favorite part. He said, people like Big T literally thought he was named Mans, which is so funny. <laughs> How disappointed was Big T when he met Peter in real life? Uh, I think he was very disappointed. He, I think Big T, like there are legit people that, thought the man's was like the coolest person ever and thought I'm just like the biggest cuck, like beta boy. <laughs> like it, it, it's very hard. Like I have people too, that will com comment on my stuff and be like, just bring back man's. Even uh, Levitan is constantly telling me, he's like, just, just be done with your shit. Just bring back man. So I'm, I'm used to it at this point. What is, what is the origin of the man's? How did we, uh, I don't want to say create, like uh, how did we meet the man's? When, when did it become a new existence that you're to, you, to the best of your knowledge? Yeah. Uh, I will you know what? I'll actually go, I'll give the real story. I don't even know if I've ever said it there. I, it, this was probably three or four years ago. I need to figure out when I actually started doing it, but I had, um, I tried to get a job. Uh, DraftKings had an on-camera uh, job available and I went in and auditioned for it and I didn't get it and I shouldn't have gotten it. I was pretty green <laughs> on camera at the time. I had done a lot of improv experience and, and kind of, you know, live comedy, but I had never done a lot of recorded stuff. And I came out of that being like, I need to start. I enjoy doing this. I need to start putting something on video um, and getting reps. And But then immediately I was like, I don't want to be a tout guy. I don't want to be doing this stuff. I like comedy. So why don't we go with a character? 
route. And uh, there were, at the time, there were just some, some things in the DFS industry that seemed easily uh, or easy to spoof. And so the man's was kind of born to uh, poke fun at the, uh, the hothead macho, uh, cool DFS bro guy. Is that the fantasy football counselor? Did he help inspire he, this? Uh... He was. That's the thing that people, people kind of, I started posting about the counselor about a year ago, but I've legit been following him for four or five years, like back before he had even pivoted to going full tout, back when he just had a brand called Fantasy Frames where he was selling. Uh, basically, his thing was a, a frame where the guys who won your team, you got the trading card and you put them in the frame to memorialize your winning season. That was his business before he became the counselor. So yes, it, the counselor was uh, definitely a direct inspiration to the man's way back when. Who loves fantasy football that much? And who's so proud of their team that they want to make a plaque of their, like, you know, 1990, oh, 2017 championship winning team. And they only won because they picked up the guy, the right guy, and you know, they had the right amount of fab left in week 16 or whatever. Is that, I mean, who's doing that? I don't care about it that much. Do you? So I, I'm with you. Uh, I'm, it's very <laughs> easy for me to be cynical about things, but then, I mean, you see it, like you see stuff with, the Scott Fishbowl or these things that these like community and friend and fantasy football leagues, like people live for this shit. Like it is for some people, it is their sole outlet. Um, you know, whether it's with a group of friends or, you know, people on Twitter. So I've actually become less cynical about it in that I just see how much joy and as a distraction and stuff that it provides people. So over the years, I've, I, nothing really surprises anymore. I'm just like, you love fantasy football. Got it. Yeah. I'm with you, brother. Yeah, I didn't mean to like for it to come off cynical. It just seems like no, a yeah. really strange business model, and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> that yeah, that was a I maybe launched into that tangent there, but uh, yeah, I think for him, he was he really wanted to get in the industry. He was trying to figure figure stuff out. He had he had gotten Martavis Bryant to back that product uh, back <laughs> that dates uh, the story. Yeah, and David Johnson before he broke out his rookie year on the Cardinals. So he uh, he pivoted, and uh, yeah, he's doing uh, he's doing all right. I honestly don't know about the fantasy football counselor outside of you. I know you basically tweeting about him, but he was a big thing at some point. Or is a big, big thing. Oh, now. he's a huge I, I don't thing. Know. Yeah. Um, I, it's funny. I go on shows now and people want to talk to me more about the counselor than anything else. And I don't <laughs> even blame him because uh, I think he's uh, fascinating, but no, yeah, he's absolutely destroying on Instagram uh, by far the biggest fantasy account. He has insane engagement. People always want to say like he bought some followers, which I'm sure he did, but go read the comments. He, he has just a massively engaged fan base. Uh, he destroys. So like, who, who's giving who the rub? Are you giving him the rub or is he giving you the rub? Or how, is it kind of, just kind of goes both ways as far as... We're, we're buddies. Like I, I tag him and stuff. I did an interview with him last year. I, I told him like he knows that I post his stuff on Twitter. Um, I think he's smart in that he realizes uh, he falls into that camp of there's no such thing as bad publicity. So he, I think he just sees it as if you want to boost me out to everyone on Twitter when I'm not focusing there, go for it. So when you started as the, when the, when the man's uh, became a thing, you were kind of throwing it out there as a character three years ago, four years ago, whatever it was, give or take. And again, I don't know why I keep saying character as a person that came into your life, I suppose. Um, how many followers did you have? Were you sort of an unknown at that time? Yeah, uh, definitely. I had, um, I had started out, I, I first started doing kind of fantasy content with some of my buddies who I did improv with that we all discovered we liked fantasy. And so we started doing this live show, uh, the fantasy football comedy hour. And then we're like, okay, we're doing this for, you know, improv and comedy nerds in Cambridge, Massachusetts and like 80 person black box theaters. Like what are the odds we can fill this theater with people that care about fantasy football and comedy? We learned uh, not good. So we pivoted it to a podcast and that's kind of how I started. And from there, that was when I started doing a little bit more stuff. But yeah, no, I was, I don't, I think I was well under uh, a thousand or a couple thousand followers when I, when I launched the man stuff. Yeah, a little too niche, a little too narrow cast it there as far as uh, your, your target audience. Story uh, of my but, life. <laughs> walk, walk back for a second. Tell me about improv. What was that like? I've never done improv before, but I think it's a, it's a fascinating concept. It's just a, it, it seems like an interesting world. Uh, yeah. Just agree with everything. Yes, and. Yes, and. That, that's what I'm told. At least Michael Scott taught me that. Is that how that works? Yeah, it's funny. I think that mantra gets uh, bastardized a little bit. There's more nuance to it, but it's just that idea of like, I'm not going to automatically shut down your idea. I might even disagree with what you're saying, but I'm going to I'm going to meet you halfway and we are going to build 
something together. Uh, in, in the case of improv, it's a scene. Um, but then people apply it to kind of a more of a life mantra too, where it's just like have an open mind, say yes to things uh, and, and see where it gets you. But yeah, I had um, I had moved out to Boston because uh, my wife was out here, my, my girlfriend at the time. And uh, I just wanted a chance to meet some new people. You know, I only had her family and her friends didn't know anyone out here. And it was something, you know, I grew up watching Whose Line Is It Anyways. <laughs> and that's, that's more short form uh, improv. I ended up doing long form improv. Uh, but that was kind of always something in the back of my head. So I, I started taking classes at the theater and yeah, ended up performing there for about four to five years until I was like, I don't want to keep doing content that disappears and you have nothing to show for it. Uh, I'll start doing some stuff online that more people can see. Were you, a, were you a, a, a Ryan guy? Were you a Wayne Brady guy? Who was your guy? Was it Drew Carey? You who, know who was- what? It's funny. I, I do think I was most blown away by Wayne Brady's talent. Uh, especially the musical stuff. I have, I actually have done a little bit of musical improv and boy, God, I'm glad there's not any footage of that because I, I can't hit a note to save my life. And so to see Wayne Brady be that quick and still be able to do it on in tune, I was always floored by his improv talent level. Does improv get a bad rap because people sort of kind of besmirch it and it seems really, really hard. It seems like one of those things that most people think they can do but if they try it, it's probably really, really hard, I imagine. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, be it, probably, it probably should get a bad rap because if you've ever gone and seen just like a, a random local improv show, it's either, if it's short form, it can be very hacky, um, lots of puns and stuff like that. If you see long form and you're not seeing like people who are veterans at it, it's it's horrible to watch. It's like going to a, a an open mic and watching someone who's only been doing stand up for 10 times. Like you feel uncomfortable watching them. So, <laughs> but I will say, and obviously I'm biased because I've done it, but seeing like the best of the best do long form improv, the people that or most people would be familiar with is like the UCB core four, which is like Amy Poehler and Matt Besser and some of these teams now, um, that perform at the UCB, people recognize them now, like Zach Woods from The Office, Thomas Middleditch from Silicon Valley, Ben Schwartz from Parks and Rec. Those guys are some of the most insane on another level improvisers you will ever see. And when you watch them do it, it it truly feels like magic where the people in the show after go, no, 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 that was scripted. They had to have planned it. And you're like, no, no, that's that's the, the magic and the beauty of it. I think of Second City as well, too, in Chicago. And you mentioned Middle Ditch. He's got a he's got a special on Netflix. I haven't watched it just yet, but I imagine that's something that's right up your alley. Are you aware yeah. of this? Yeah, no, I did. I did watch it. I actually, my wife and I saw them do one of their shows live here in Boston when Ben Schwartz and him came through. I am, I don't know about you. I know you watch, uh, uh, you're, you're a pop culture uh, savant yourself here. I don't like watching stand-up and like specials and stuff on Netflix. I love stand up and I, I see it live, but for some reason it doesn't translate for me. And the improv thing was pretty similar. Improv is so hard to translate to the screen because so much of it is being in the room and feeling that energy and the risk of being like, this might not work out. They might bomb. When you see it on Netflix, you know this didn't bomb because they cleaned it up or they picked the yeah. shows or the sets that they, they like. And so it, it just doesn't work for me. Uh, Boston area, Boston's favorites for comedy was uh, Louis C.K., I believe, is a, is a Boston guy. Uh, he's, uh, Bill Burr, isn't he a Boston guy as well? Yeah. Stephen, Stephen Wright uh, was a Boston guy if you want to go old school. Do, yeah. uh, do you see, uh, I guess not today, but <laughs> have, you, have you in the, who in the past can you recall seeing uh, at a comedy club that you really just kind of stood up for you? Yeah, I mean, I guess I haven't, uh, I, I have seen Bill Burr shows in Boston. Uh, I've, I've seen more kind of contemporary comics that aren't from Boston per se. You know, I've, I, I always see John Mulaney when he comes through town, uh, Hannibal Burris. So there, you know, Boston has a really good scene for, for stand up. And yeah, a lot of guys, like you mentioned, got their start here. There's this famous venue um, above the, the Hong Kong uh, in, in Cambridge. It's a, it's a Chinese restaurant and above it. There's just this small comedy store um, venue and a lot of guys that people know today got their start uh, doing shows there while people in the audience ordered scorpion bowls and stuff. So there's some cool Boston comedy mythology around here. It's an interesting, interesting melding. Is there any video of your, you mentioned there's no video of you doing improv. Is there any video of your, uh, what you said the DK as far as your, uh, you know, your audition, is that out there someplace? No, no, no. That was, that was like, I went into the studio and I didn't even have any 
clue for what I was doing. I ended up, I wasn't sure if I was going to have a teleprompter or not. So I was like kind of <laughs> memorizing like a couple things. It was just a total disaster. Um, but yeah, there's no footage of it that I know of. Um, maybe they have it buried somewhere. And uh, I, I pray to God that I never cross them in a way that they feel like leaking that. So the mans became a thing. You had about a thousand, or I don't know if it's a thing. It's uh, you introduced the mans. The mans was introduced to your world, however you want to say it. Uh, you had about a thousand or so followers out there. Uh, how how does this snowball? Does somebody does Levitan? Does Bales? Does somebody kind of notice you and give you some retweets, and all of a sudden you get the bump? How did you like take me through like the first guy to kind of sort of quote unquote discover you and elevate you and like, get you on your way? Yeah, I started doing that again. I can't remember the specific year, but it was in the fall, you know, during the football season. And my first big video was the Swole Cast parody slash audition tape. And, you know, I was a huge fan of the Swole Cast. It was my favorite show to watch. You know, it does everything that I enjoy doing, which is blending what I consider, you know, entertainment and comedy with, you know, a little bit of actionable DFS content. Um, and we'll use actionable. That's debatable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Loose very, <laughs> very loose, especially in our off season form. But yeah, so I was like, what if I do, um, uh, an audition where I basically impersonate, uh, all four of them as the man's, which actually was like hard for in my head. Cause it's like, I'm being the man's and the man's is impersonating them. Uh, but yeah, that, uh, <laughs> all of those guys really enjoyed that. And, that was fun and kind of got me on the radar of some more DFS people, but it was really, um, I did, I went out to every year, uh, in the before times, I would go out to Vegas with my college buddies, uh, NFL divisional round weekend. And we just have the same routine where we go and play poker both nights. We post up and watch football, um, on Saturday and Sunday. And I said, you know what? I got this man's character. I've been doing DFS stuff. Let's do a little bit of world building and I'll play at uh, the poker tables as man's that night and record like a vlog. And that video ended up blowing up and like the poker world got a hold of it. And so my most successful video right out of the gate was my first poker one. And then that kind of just led to some really interesting opportunities. I started doing videos for a site um, called poker tube. They sent me out to the world series of poker as man. So that was fun. And then I started doing a few poker night in America. I was like this, um, I was like the sideline reporter type thing to these heads up matches. So the first one involved <laughs> Phil Helm youth and, um, uh, uh, who am I blanking? Olivier Bousquet and stuff. So there were some big time poker pros and I was just coming in and basically filling dead air doing broadcasting with Doug Polk. So it just led to a bunch of uh, interesting, cool things. Ended up doing the gambling Olympics with the, with the action network guys. And uh, yeah, so it was just kind of a, a fun thing that led to some, some interesting opportunities. All right. I have a lot of questions. Uh, okay. It. So are, are you like Sasha Baron Cohen? Like what he's doing Borat, how dedicated are you to the man's like, if you're going, uh, to the gym, uh, are you dressed up as the man's? Well, I guess that, that would be easy. If you're going to dinner, you're going to breakfast, are you the man's? Are you 24 hours a day? Are you the man's? No, no, not even, not even close. I, I, what I enjoyed about it is that I like, I put it on, I do the bit and then I'm done with it. It was actually kind of hard being at the world series of poker and stuff. Cause I was in character for so long. Um, <laughs> like, cause I, I made it to day two of, of one of the tournaments. And so that was like eight hours at a table, just in character. Um, and obviously my energy levels are dropping too. And I'm like, people are now expecting me to be this guy. So yeah, it, like to give people a frame of reference, I don't know if people in the poker world will know this guy, it's Uncle Ron. Uh, he is a, a character and I did some stuff with him when I went out there for a <laughs> Poker Go live stream and he does not break character. Like I went and showered <laughs> after the show, we went out and got food and drinks. He's still in character the whole time. And I'm, I'm like, between me and him, I'm like, dude, are you, are you going to break this? Are you going to break this character? <laughs> He's just like, no. So yeah, I am not on that Sasha Baron Cohen level. I like coming in and coming out. Okay. So is there an advantage to playing as the man's? Because I would imagine poker players, a lot of it, uh, not my expertise, but I'm certainly aware, uh, like reading players and like trying to understand what your thought process is and why you're raising and why you're folding. And like, does the man's, like, are people trying to figure out what the man's is doing? And are you doing it just because you're playing the man's or are you doing it because, you know, that's the smart poker move in that instance. You know what I'm saying here? Yeah, I think I definitely, to your point, I think I got some more action that I might <laughs> not get because people just assume I'm going to be this hotshot bluff spewer. And I, myself, I play kind of tight, aggressive, and I was playing even more tight 
in the World Series of Poker. One, because it was like a $3,000 buy-in. Two, I'm trying to stretch this out so I can get the most content. You know, if I go in there and bluff it off in four minutes, it's like, what, what the Your hell am sucks. I doing? Yeah. So I was playing pretty conservative and I do think I got some folds um, from people because they're like, who is this clown? There's no way um, this, you know, if, if you're going over the top with your persona that you'd then just be a nit at the table, which I kind of was. What sort of table talk are we getting? Like, do people, are people aware of this gimmick? Do they know, there are some are kind of in the middle. Some probably think that's just who you are and that we're just gonna, like, is there any sort of weird table talk or like half table knows what's going on or some people know what's going on or what yeah. do they think of you? It was funny because I ended up looking back at my table. It was it was this 3K no limit tournament and there ended up being like a bunch of heavy hitters at the day. There was a couple of these like European pros. There was a guy who had gotten second place in the main event, like all this stuff. And they weren't aware of the character. <laughs> and because I stayed in it for so long without breaking, I do think they just thought the man's was the man's because I wasn't like at a 10 the whole time. You can't be at a 10 for eight hours at the table. So my, I would be quiet for stretches and stuff and, you know, pick my spot. So I, I think they literally just thought that was me. And because at the world series of poker, lots of people wear sunglasses. It's not that weird. Uh, yeah. And because you see lots of guys there that have that look, the oversized basketball Jersey, the, you know, the baggy sweatpants that I don't think it registered as that out of the norm, which is why I think the character works. If it, if it passes as realistic. And you can record yourself at the table or you have to do a kind of secret. But how does that work? I, I, for some reason in my head, I assume like you can't do that, but I guess it's, you got permission or. It's weird. The poker. Uh, and I, and I know this too, from just following some of the, the poker vloggers and stuff, but um, as long as you're not like recording your cards, the, the poker attitude in, in Vegas poker rooms is pretty flexible and loose with stuff you do with your camera. It's not like the blackjack table, right? Where you lift for your phone and they're like, no, 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 no. Well, that, um, that's the house's buddy. They don't care about the other player's buddy. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, you can, um, I, I, I filmed like my vlogs and at the world series of poker, just nonstop at the table showing stuff and, and no one cared. Oh man. So, and how did, do you remember getting knocked out? And then like, did you get, and like you, you, uh, did you have like a post, a uh, post game interview? And did, yeah. Uh, so this work? is, this is actually a sore subject because uh -oh. I made it to the second day and I, I was a low chip stack cause I had kind of nursed it the first day and out of the gate, the second day, I won a couple big pots and we were, you know, just cruising to the, to the, um, the bubble. So I was like, look, and you know, they, they had free rolled me in this tournament. And we had also done a giveaway where I was giving, um, it was like 25% of my winnings to someone who had won this giveaway. And so I'm sitting there being like, dude, I'm, I'm set up to not only make me, but this guy, some cash, it's going to be great for all of this. First of all, I'm sitting next to Daniel Negreanu is at my day two table. <laughs> so I already have a, a heavy hitter there. There's a couple more of these like European wizard pros and I got cocky. I, I turned into the man's <laughs> where I won a few pots. I'm looking at my chip stack. And I, I do like to bluff and be a bully when I have some chips. And I tried to steamroll this uh, European guy. And just everything I know about, okay, his range based on him continuing to call. And I just didn't care. I just kept barreling and barreling into him until I, I basically bluffed off my entire stack. Like, 20 spots from the bubble and i was like what the hell did i just do so yeah that's a big regret a big regret it probably made for a good video though it did i i shot a vlog where i walked into the rio pool fully closed just like face planted uh right into it <laughs> and when you were doing you're saying a silent reporter as well uh did they know when you're interviewing them like the, the, some people had to know some people didn't know they're probably like just you know, just appeasing you, I suppose. Anybody call you out and say, who the hell is this guy? Or yeah, any, any sort of memorable interview that stands out to you? Yeah, Matt Glantz, who's a poker player and who had kind of found me to to do that, he, he prepped uh, those guys. It was funny, though, like, a couple of them um, were on board for it. Phil Helmuth fell into the camp where I just don't think he was able to process like the, the conceptually the idea of a character. He was just like, you are you. Um, <laughs> and so, but Phil... Phil is such a good sport that he just rolled with it. I did a bit that I don't think ever they recorded it, but it never got released. He was doing a book signing at the, the thing because one of his new books had just come out. And I crashed the book signing and was asking people in line if they would rather have the man sign their book instead of Phil Helmuth. And he was a, legitimately a very good sport about it and, and had fun with it. So yeah, most people, if you let them in on the joke, uh, they're they're more inclined to to have fun with it. Who won that poll? Out of curiosity, 
the uh which one how old versus the man's like you said who who was uh the overwhelming favorite who, who would people rather have to sign their book you know uh he had a big head start considering someone who was willing to wait in line to get a signature was already a big time uh phil fan but i do think i won some people over <laughs> oh man so i kind of sort of so at some point I, I for in my brain i have you with like bales and levitan did you sort of you know, i guess at the action network where you guys kind of sort of uh cross paths yeah, I mean, that was just the the Gambling Olympics was hosted by them. But yeah, Levitan was one of the first guys that started sharing the man stuff. He was the first um, interview I did in person as the man's was Levitan. Um, and yeah, he, he was a supporter of it early on. And I think I did a couple bits uh, about uh, some bail stuff as well. So I got on their radar and then it was uh, Bales had put out something on Twitter where he was like, I'm interested in doing some, you know, workout athletic props, which as we know, he's uh, pretty good at. And so I thought, oh, this would be a fun opportunity. What if I challenge him to something? And I, I came up with the idea of the broathlon, which was basically a combination of physical activity and drinking. And so I challenged him and Levitan and that spring we all got together in Philadelphia and had this broathlon where we did a beer mile and all this stuff. So that, that's how I got to know those guys. What are the highlights in the broathlon? Anything sort of stand out for you? So the highlight is probably me. Uh, well, Bale's one, which is shocker. shocker. Uh, surprise, he surprise. was the shock, I assume. You know what? I legit thought I was going to win um, because the beer mile, I did win, um, but I threw up and I, we had made a rule where if you throw up, you had to add a penalty lap. So not only did I throw up, but I still beat them with an extra quarter mile lap. Um, but then there were some other things where Bales got me he, like the field goal kicking. He was like oddly really good at. And then we also did this two on two football stuff with a quarterback, a receiver, and one of his defense. And so when Levitan was my quarterback, he just hung me out to dry. I think the fix was in. Um, yeah, I'm still a little bitter about it. Even the follow-up broathlon, which I also thought I was going to win, uh, CSU Ram won that one. So Manns is 0-2 in events he's created solely for the purpose of him winning said event. I, I, I hesitate to ask about this one, but I'm fascinated by the concept. Uh, did you create, were you, how, in what way were you a part of the 6, 12, 18, 24 challenge? Yeah, so I was, I didn't <laughs> and, have a huge... And feel free to elaborate on what that is too. <laughs> yeah, so the 6, 12, 18, 24 was another prop bet the following year that Bales ended up uh, agreeing to, which is you have to decide which of those denominations to apply to miles run, donuts eaten, uh, beers drank, and for a lack of a better term, jack offs. Um, and so you can assign those however you want. You know, a lot of people think, you know, oh, I'll eat 24 donuts. That's the easy one, blah, blah, blah. Some people might think otherwise. So Bales took this on out there when we were doing the gambling Olympics. And Do you remember the odds of that by chance? Was there an odds for that? Like a, they had to be a spread, I'm, right? I'm pretty sure it was close to even money. He, his biggest bet was with Levitan and uh, <laughs> it ended up in a buyout because Bales felt so crummy, but Levitan knew that he was going to be able to finish it. So Levitan's like, I'll just recoup some money. And Bales like, I won't have to feel sick for the rest of the trip. Fortunately, um, Friedman, Matthew Friedman was the hazmat suit wearing judge. <laughs> and he I drew the short just, straw. <laughs> he drew the, I, actually, no, he, he loved it. He, he <laughs> wanted that job. Uh, so yes, he was going in and um, again, let's just say he was reviewing Kleenexes to uh, authenticate it. So yeah, luckily I was not in the weeds on that one. What was the what was his strategy? What do you remember what he delegated for each one? Like, and, like is there a, a clear path? Like you said, twenty four donuts. Uh, do you remember what he went with? Yeah. So I did just remember there one thing. So uh, about even money, uh, the the big hang up on the bet was he, there was a, a max amount of time that he could do the six miles in because he didn't want him to just be able to like walk or really slow it like levitan thought that's where he had an edge him having to run that in the vegas heat in midsummer uh and and so it was under an hour i believe and so yeah he did he did miles um then jack offs then donuts then beers i want to say we well, can jump back and forth though, right? I think or no. So with their stipulation, he had to do the running all at once, and then the other ones he could weave in and out as he pleased. 
<laughs> are these jelly donuts or these powder? This had to be talked about, I'd imagine. What kind of yeah, donut? I'm these pretty are, sure it important. was just no, no, I now remember because there's a there's a photo I'm thinking of. It was a standard uh Krispy Kreme uh set of donuts. <laughs> I'm not gonna touch that one at all, but there's a way up just sitting right there. Uh, I know, I'm with you. I got some uh I got some word association for you. Are you ready? Yeah. Although too, I, first of all, we got to circle back. I was correct on who asked those specific questions, right? Oh yeah. I never clarified. Yeah. I, you, you were correct. Uh, uh, Tuttle was throwing you under the bus as far as your TikTok account, which I guess you can kind of sort of piece together too, because he was, he, he did he open an account specifically just to throw shade at you? I didn't know he was on TikTok. I have no, no he, he's been, he's been on there for a while. Uh, okay. Cause we used to talk shop and then he, he had his big uh, uh, bang, bang at me, the walking on a dream uh, TikTok, <laughs> which was uh, his, uh, his big viral TikTok. So yeah, no, he, he's been over there uh, for a while. It's always weird because whenever I do these, I like to jump on somebody's Twitter and see what they've done like the last six months, last year, whatever it is. And then, then I start favoriting tweets from like six months ago. And it's always like, who is favoriting my tweet from six months ago? You stalker. That's so weird. Why are you doing that? And then I don't want that. I like, well, I probably shouldn't do that because I don't want somebody to think, well, that's kind of odd. That's strange. So just, I'm just taking you inside my brain. That's what I was doing for you. Those good times for sure. I don't think it's weird at all on Twitter. Uh, it, not at all. I think it's more weird. Like if you do it to Instagram, like someone you went to high school with or something <laughs> that you haven't talked to. And then you're like, what in the world? Cause then you start backtracing like this person just scrolled through my entire timeline. What are they doing? Are your high school friends like still friends of yours today? Is it like they, they're also your college friends. How did that work? Yeah, I would say I'm definitely closer with my college friends uh, today, but yeah, when I go back home to Colorado, most of them are still there or have moved back there and and yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll sync up with them, but yeah, I go home to Colorado a couple times a year. Was Colorado also college or, or uh, Massachusetts was college? No, I was kind of all over the place. I went to school in San Diego and then I met my wife studying abroad in Spain. She was from Boston, but we were both in the same study abroad program. And then I moved out here from California when I graduated. See, that's some really pretty fun places to live. San Diego seems like a good, good times for sure. And what was it like living, uh, living abroad? It was, it was great. I mean, it was definitely the, the funnest time of my life. I did a homestay. So I lived with a, a family there in Granada, Spain, and it was intimidating because I had done, you know, high school Spanish a few years and I was, you know, very baseline and they put me, I mean, I requested it. I think the curveball was is most people had a roommate. So it'd be you, another American, and then staying in your homestay. I somehow drew the short end of the stick. It actually ended up being good because I had my own room, but I was by myself. And so I'm going to meet my homestay mother. They don't speak any English. <laughs> She's trying to talk to me. I know like four words in Spanish. Uh, so it was intimidating at first, but it really ended up being a cool experience because it forced me out of necessity to really get good at Spanish just so I could communicate with my homestay and uh, ended up being something I was, I was very grateful for. And did you also have a chance to jump around, not just from Spain, but the, the European countries, obviously, it's like jumping from state to state almost. They're, they're, they're that close where, and the cultures are just distinctly different. So where else do we want her to if we had a chance? Or I guess you're too busy studying or you know, having a, all other times uh, shenanigans of some sorts. Yeah, no, it was kind of, um, I was always torn about it because I loved Granada and, and Southern Spain, that whole region, Andalusia, it's just so gorgeous. And it, you know, it's why I stayed there. So it was always torn because it'd be like, I'd be in school and then we'd be going away on the weekends all the time. Cause I had never been to Europe and I wanted to see a bunch of stuff. So I ended up just doing a ton of traveling all over Spain, Portugal, Morocco, uh, Scandinavia, Amsterdam, uh, Italy, Ireland, England. Yeah. We were all over the place. You're playing like a Euro trip, the home version, man. What, <laughs> yeah. what, what stands out? You threw out a bunch of countries. Like give me something that sort of just, I mean, obviously there's a whole bunch of memories, I'm sure, but uh, anything sort of distinct just kind of jumped to, jump to the front as far as like your favorite memories of living over there in Europe. And Yeah. Disney. My wife would probably kill me if I didn't say meeting her uh, over <laughs> there. Uh, as far as travel, man, um, I can give a few. I love Scandinavia. Um, they have like the archipelagos out there where you take these kind of boats out there and you can just drop off and hop around these islands and, and it's gorgeous. Um, I loved uh, Western Ireland. I went to Galway and the Cliffs of Moher and uh, you know the rolling green hills out there. I loved Italy, Cinque Terre, the five towns where you can walk through. Um, I would say those were, were some of my favorites. Is there like one like cultural difference, not better, not worse, but just one that's just sort of like you did not plan for it and not anticipate like saying, well, that's, that's different. I've never heard of that concept and just sort of throw you off temporarily. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of gone away now just because of international markets. But the Spanish afternoon siesta was a real thing. Uh, <laughs> they had basically everything shuts down, including classes from like 1 to 5 p.m. And so you would have some classes in the morning. You'd go home. You'd have a big lunch because that is their main meal that they eat there. Um, and then you take a nap or, you know, I wasn't always willing to take a nap. You know, I was a college kid that was in a new country, but, uh, you know, it's like we kindergarten were, all over again. Yeah, exactly. So, but it would be nice. Cause we'd have nights where we were out super late, obviously all the bars and discotecas are open late and you'd really be looking forward to that nap. And then everything kind of starts opening up again at five thirty six. They eat really late dinners there and you don't go out to the bar until like 11 PM. So just that whole kind of schedule with daily life was a big change, but I loved it. That sounds, that sounds like a lot of fun. I, I mean, I'd give it a shot, see what happens. Um, so now I presume you're in some sort of quarantine. Are you, are you antsy right now? What, what are we doing? Uh, what, what day are we on? Uh, how much are you getting out? Obviously it depends on where you're at in the country and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, I'm outside of, of Boston and I've definitely been on the uh, conservative side with um, my risk tolerance and stuff. We've started going um, to see my in-laws a couple times. And again, just to, you know, if we're going to be seeing them, I want to be extremely careful. So I've been on lockdown outside of the kind of necessities. And, you know, I, I assume like everybody, you have your good days and bad days. Um, you know, there's only a couple things I really miss. It is doing like traveling and trips. Normally the summer, I like doing a couple trips. Um, so that's been a bummer. I do miss the gym, but kind of making do with some online classes and, and doing stuff um, outdoors and stuff. So that's that's not too bad. And, and as, as you mentioned before, I've just been doing a ton of shows, uh, a ton of videos and kind of normally this is my time to decompress, like, you know, go all out in the season, take a few months off, recharge the batteries. And that really hasn't been the case because we've just all been at our computers nonstop. So it's been good and bad. I've had, er, I've had a lot of fun doing it, but I also uh, need to make sure I don't burn out. Yeah, you're pumping out all sorts of uh, content, of course, for football season coming up and you're doing LOL content. I'm not sure. Um, have you recently logged in and checked out your RG ranking? Because I don't, you're sitting down. Uh, you went from, uh, let me see if I have this correct. Oh God, you did the research for this? You were once an esports thought leader. I don't know if you still are. I don't know if the rules are. You have to be in the top X number to be a thought leader. I don't know how you qualify if there's a board for <laughs> such things. But you were, I believe you were 44 on the RG rankings at some point. Is it the highest you were? That's the that's as far back as I got. Yeah, like, I mean, that's, that's pretty damn high. 44 to 50, 50 44 is impressive. That's good. Uh, yeah. 59, 70, you dropped to 119. Your current ranking oh god I, again i'm not here to revoke your status as thought oh, leader i don't know how you're 224 oh god <laughs> how, the, <laughs> how the mighty have fallen <laughs> uh, you're doing a show i think you're doing content with um uh with, with brick uh, brian hooper yeah so is, is what's going on here you're you're just a ho I, I imagine he's playing a ton because that guy plays everything yeah he's a beast um yeah it was well is this a thing I mean, is this something you played beforehand like on your own so that the, the show is funny because um, we had been messaging and he was like, Hey, would you want to do just kind of a weekly show, you know, talk DFS and, and also just have fun and stuff. And I was like, yeah, this sounds, this sounds like a good time. And our, the first night we recorded our show was the Rudy Gobert night. Oh. And so the plan was like, you know, we got NBA, we got everything going on. We'll, you know, do a show. So immediately that first night that the tables were flipped on us, I don't even think we had named the show. And so it was like a week later, League of Legends pops up, you know, out of the ashes of coronavirus and quarantine comes League of Legends. We're like, what if we just named the show League of Legends? And the first few shows we pretended like we had been um, League of Legends fans for our entire lives. And uh, so now that's just the name of the show. Uh, but yeah, there was a stretch there for about a month where I was just hardcore grinding League of Legends DFS. So the show essentially had no intent of talking about LL, it just sort of happened organically. Yeah, it was just going to be a general weekly DFS, you know, kind of lifestyle, shoot the shit show. And uh, it just got thrown into uh, League of Legends there for a spell. That That's wild. I had no idea. I was going to say, well, you're first to market with the first LOL show, to my knowledge, at least. But no, it just sort of happened organically that I guess this is as an LOL show now. 
Well, they got, it was, it was funny early on uh, because, you know, I started joking around uh, about being so good at esports DFS and some of the original <laughs> guys in there really took umbrage to that and were, <laughs> were battling me. And then that's where the, uh, the bit about Brian and I trying to remove toxicity in the esports space came from. Uh, Cause I was receiving legitimately toxic messages uh, from people who, who did not think of me as the esports thought leader that I did. Some people just take themselves a little bit too seriously sometimes. Uh, what's the meanest tweet on that? Is there what's the meanest tweet you've ever got? Can you think of one or two? Is anything kind of sort of stand out? You know what's the the thing is is if it's if it's like an out of left field mean tweet, um, I I legitimately find it funny. The, if you really want to get underneath my skin, you say like you're a hack. This isn't funny. Like that, that's how you, you get to me. Uh, and fortunately I don't get a ton of those. I'm sure people think it, but I don't get a ton. But when people just come to me and are angry, that, that never upsets me. It, it makes me laugh. I mean, you found this niche and there's a billion people, give or take, uh, doing DFS or football content and so many sort of sound the same. And then I'm sure like if you, if somebody asks you for advice, like, how do I start? How do I start doing it? And you made it happen. Like you be different, stand out in some way. And you certainly do that. And uh, I would imagine that that's the kind of sort of the advice you'd give to some degree. Yeah, for sure. I, I think, yeah, you probably get those questions a lot, right? From people who are like, how do I do this? And I am not, I love playing DFS. I, I love using the DFS tools. I love analytic evidence-based content as a, as a consumer of it. But my brain doesn't work like that. I don't think like a tout. I don't want to produce content that a tout does and so but i do love this stuff and i like doing comedy and entertainment so to me it was just like you know what can i do that uh, maybe other people aren't doing that i think i'm i'm good at and yeah that i think that is the advice is either find a very specific niche or you know you see everyone like how many people want to be a fantasy football tout i mean it's the market is so unbelievably saturated you are playing the same game as hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people so you have to be that much better at them so i would just say play a different game uh you know approach it from a different angle where you have to compete with less people to succeed and it kind of walks back to the counselor too like the counselor whatever you may or may not think of his content it's definitely different and you remember him and he stands out yeah right it doesn't yeah. really get lost in the shuffle in the, I was talking about this with Fantasy Mansion the other day on his show, but the, guy. the thing that, yeah, he, he's, he's great uh, with the radio and, and the engagement and kind of the bold hot takes that, that are polarizing but make for, for good discussion. But yeah, wow. I was talking to him. The thing people, I'm, I'm guilty of this sometimes too. Like I like firing off a tweet and just like, you know, seeing what the <laughs> fallout is and but like not really dealing with it. The counselor responds to nearly every single comment. <laughs> If you DM him, he will respond. He is so engaged with his fans. And so if someone's telling me like, how do I build up a fan base? I'd be like, well, first of all, you better be replying to anyone who's even remotely interested in what you're doing. Um, and, and that's really how I think he, he built it up. So my word association game, speaking on that a topic and speaking on like uh, any engagement is good engagement. Vegas Dave, <laughs> like, I mean, I, so there's a certain amount of people that would like embrace that. I mean, I personally couldn't deal with that. Like being that guy, I can't imagine being that guy. I understand that not that it might come from a jealousy perspective, something I think, but I just don't want that a muck on me for lack of a better word. Uh, what are your thoughts on a guy like Vegas Dave? Because I know you're tweeting about him. Uh, he's quarterback one. Apparently he's, yeah. he's good in the beach if nothing else. I got a message a few weeks ago because I'll favorite these tweets and people will message me and be like, why are you favoriting Vegas Dave's tweets? I'm like, because it's hilarious. Um, so yeah, Vegas Dave is definitely in the counselor realm. He is so absurdly over the top. Um, but I actually think, again, maybe I'm just willing to give these guys so much credit. Like no one will disagree that he's a complete hack and a scam artist, but he's self-aware and he knows uh, what gets people talking. You know, it's not even that different from what a Rovell will do. Like Rovell will do stupid shit online and get people talking about it. And everyone's like, what are you doing? This is so cringeworthy. It's like, dude, that is what he is going for. He is trying to get you to say this is cringeworthy. And I think Vegas Dave um, understands that game. I don't know. See, Darren Rovell's is more sustainable though. I don't know how sustainable Vegas Dave's is once he burns through everyone that he's extracted money from. <laughs> but as far as from like a content standpoint, uh, I think it's incredible. I think it's hilarious. I think the way he he's trying to sell a lifestyle 
And when you can see through the veneer and you know the truth, it makes that content all the better and more entertaining, but it really riles people up for some reason. It's like, if you want these guys to go away, I don't, they provide me so much entertainment joy, but if you want them to go away, ignore them. If Darren Rovell drives you crazy, don't respond to his tweets. You guys don't get how this works. The social algorithms, any engagement is good engagement. So if you want them to go away, stop talking about it. But calling them out for how terrible they are gets you clicks. So it's almost like you guys are working together. And that's the thing with Vegas Days. That's, that's kind of the struggle I have. It's like, I don't want to bring attention to this dirtbag. Even if I say this guy is a dirtbag, watch him being a clown. He's going to get, well, me, anybody, somebody bigger than me, whatever, is going to get more followers. And even you can use the Colin Coward example who recently, I mean, I don't know how savvy he may or may not be, but it seems like intentionally he was talking about the top five arms in the NFL and he had Goff at number five and he left Mahomes off the list. And everybody says, well, what a clown Coward is. And everybody's dunking on him, retweeting him. And I guarantee you he had more followers at the end of that day than he did at the start of the day. So who's smart and who's not? hundred percent. Yeah. It's, it's again, they, they understand the game. I think too, like, um, you know, I guess I don't always do this, but if you want to have your cake and eat it too, take the screenshot of the tweet or post, you know, like I, I take screenshots yeah. of the counselors where you're not giving them the engagement, you're giving them the exposure, but you're not giving them the social media engagement, which is what they really want. So I would recommend if you want to dunk on people, screenshot it, don't give them the benefit of the doubt of getting the replies that boost the tweet and get it seen by more people. Uh, talk to me about uh, Bitcoin and then uh, how, how did that uh, kind of melds into, I imagine it's in the same world, uh, the man's coin. <laughs> yeah. So that was again, back during that time when we had the crypto bull run. Um, I personally uh, am a, have been a long-term Bitcoin hodler. I still have a weekly buy up uh, where I invest in a little bit of Bitcoin. Um, definitely have faith in it as a long-term uh, store of value, but yeah. Did it you was get to it early by chance, or were you, were you one of those people, or just you, you didn't follow? You, didn't, you weren't lucky where you're just. I know some people got it through poker because there are some sites. Yeah. It, okay, so go ahead. I mean, no, that's off, I actually curious. got it too from just depositing on some sites, and that um, was kind of my introduction to it. So I actually knew how to use it, which I think is a big barrier of entry because if you haven't gone through that process, you're kind of like, this is so abstract. What am I doing? Um, but yeah, it was one of those things where I had done DFS and poker with the man stuff. Uh, and I was like, there's this crypto boom. It was also the time where everyone was talking about shit coins, these altcoins, where they've all pretty much faded away now. And, and everyone kind of just implicitly acknowledged that it was a scam. But there were these kind of quick rich schemes with that. And even I was buying stupid, you know, shit coins there for a while. And so I was like, what better than the man's to want to get in on this, you know, get rich quick scheme. And so I was trying to think of things. And I'm like, man's isn't smart enough to do, you know, cryptography and make his own coin, but he would definitely try to get in on the name of crypto <laughs> in his own way. And, and hence uh, physical cryptocurrency was born. Officially and unofficially, how many man's coins chips are out there in circulation? So uh, there were, the initial batch was 69 were made. Of course. Uh, <laughs> so, 70 would be too much, 68 not yeah. enough, but yeah. And which was actually good. It's kind of what drives the Bitcoin demand, right? Is because there's this scarcity. There's only ever going to be 21 million of them. The same thing with demand. So they actually ended up being pretty popular. Uh, <laughs> then I realized, wait, I got to keep this going. So I forked uh, the, the coin and he created man's coin lit, which was kind of like the light coin uh, to, the, to the man's coins, Bitcoin. And uh, I think I've there was, I don't know, 250 of those are out there. And I still... I timed it so bad because I stopped doing man stuff, but I was running out of the coins. So I ordered another batch right as I was like done doing it. So I still have a lot of coins on shows. I'll randomly pull them out and be like, yeah, if you want to hit me up. Um, but yeah, the market's not too hot for physical crypto. Right How now. would I go about getting a man's coin? Dude, you I don't just need to put to, you on the spot or anything, but uh, yeah, no, there's, there's been people that, uh, who, who's the recent one? Oh, head chopper really wanted one. I gave one to him at the RG party uh, in January. He was, uh, he was pretty stoked <laughs> on that. Yeah, no, we can get you hooked up. Are they are they numbered? You said there were sixty nine originally. Can you say can you actually have them numbered like they are in sports cards with yeah. autographs and things like that? Or, so okay. I number them. Um, uh, I send out. Uh, look, you finally got me saying I. You know, I you got me to break <laughs> K Fob or whatever here towards the end. Um, Wrestling yeah, reference. <laughs> I do I do number them both for because I think it's fun for the scarcity element and two also for my own uh, accounting purposes. I have to keep a Excel spreadsheet for for addresses and and all that good stuff. 
Is there something you register for as far as, I, I know there's like a billion, you know, people talk about Bitcoin as a, as a general thing, but there's a, a whole list of all these Bitcoin type things. Again, I'm not savvy to this, but it's my understanding. There's a whole slew of them. Is man's coin like actually registered somewhere? Is it on a list of like on a market where it's like a penny or something like that? I, I don't know. Just throwing it out there. No, I no yeah, idea. I don't. There were, there's been a couple of guys. So it was funny because early on I, um, I was doing, um, it was basically just doing all this for the DFS crowd, right? Cause that was the audience I had yeah. and it never got into like the crypto space. Like I was like, this joke is also made for this, this booming crypto space. And I, and I tried, I just couldn't get it. You know, I was doing stuff on Reddit. I was trying to find their community, interact with them. It just didn't work. I couldn't get there, but somehow it did end up eventually getting on this thing that was called crypto collectibles, which is <laughs> funny because it actually mirrors the kind of thing that man's had seen all along, which is people love this stuff, but they still want something tangible to interact with. So people will make these art projects around um, crypto. And so it got posted on this community message board and they found the website and stuff. And so they loved it. And so I have a group of these guys who will message me. They'll do giveaways with the man's coins. They'll be like, Hey, I need another batch of these. And, um, I think they're bummed that I'm not still making content, but a lot of the stuff was evergreen. So yeah, it did finally have some, uh, crossover appeal. I had one guy for Bitcoin collectibles that made me a man's quilt i'll actually get it right now just to show you <laughs> so ridiculous i gotta see the man's quilt that's a uh, actually quilt. actually sorry it's it's too uh i have it too buried although someone made me a man spinner okay so yeah <laughs> a, a lot of these collectible guys uh got real creative with how to memorialize uh physical crypto good time to mention this is on youtube as well all these have been on youtube if you guys aren't aware we've had a bunch of interviews of course you probably or most likely listen to us on the podcast feed um yeah, has anybody in the space like wanted to interview you? Like, like what's the story? Is, is that? I mean, is there a space for crypto where there's like reporters? Is, is that? Is it gone that far or no? Yeah, I just I don't know what I don't know what happened. Uh, why I, I failed? Because I was really <laughs> trying hard. It's hard for me to even remember. I know I was interacting with some of the big crypto guys in the space. Um, you know, I tried to get a couple of them to do interviews. I, I just couldn't. I couldn't get through. I tried. Well, you know, so much for that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I do love the whole thing about it. But like, uh, I have a theory. Uh, the man's, the name, the man's. Uh, we're, whoever, I, I, this person who exists uh, outside of you, of course, uh, I'm not sure if that's his Christian name or not. I, I feel like it was inspired by the Miz. That's my hmm. guess. Do you, you know? Can you confirm, deny, do you know? I wish. I, I truly think I pulled that name out of thin air. I was I was brainstorming what is something that sounds unbelievably douchey, um, <laughs> and I, I do I do think I was just kind of knocking some some names around in my head. I don't think there was a direct inspiration. I knew I wanted it to share our first names um, to kind of hint at the the character element. Um, but yeah, I think I think I might have had like a little old school like Jersey Shore vibe kind of the italian guido even though he's not italian obviously um so the manzanelli which was you know something ethnically ambiguous but had just an air of, of douchiness to it so talk me talk to me about the whole patrick laird situation how you became a uh, best friends with patrick laird uh you're in a book club with him now apparently at least a one-time book club with the matic as well uh how did that whole thing start and did you have any idea it would end up where it ended up no, no, not at all. I, um, I think so it all started, um, with, it was like, it's even hard for me to remember. It was talking that week about picking up Patrick Laird, um, for fantasy leagues. And a couple of the guys at Rotoviz had written him up being like, Hey, this guy's going to catch a lot of passes. He'll be a good fill in. And so I had like mentioned it in the initial reaction was just very polarizing. It was like, what are you talking about? Like, who's going to play that scrub? And I just, the <laughs> light bulb went off and I was like, I'm just leaning the hell into this. Embrace it. I just embrace it. And basically I made it Patrick Laird tout week. And I think soccer Dave actually counted. He said, so that started on like Tuesday. And he said <laughs> by Sunday morning, I had done 134 Patrick Laird related tweets. Um, <laughs> and there were like, just in that short time where there were like these various themes to Patrick Laird leak by the, by the end, it had gotten very spiritual. I was doing lots of like Lord Laird puns and, um, and Laird yeah, trust. It, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Laird, all that good stuff. Um, and one of the things I'd done, I was like, 
I'm going to go. Cause I just started thinking like, I just need to keep blowing this out. So I went to the, the grocery store and I got a sheet cake and I had the lady write Patrick <laughs> Laird on it. Um, and I ended up playing him in DFS that week and he didn't do well. Yeah. And so, you know, everyone was just starting to hound me and I was like, I have this cake. And so I went live on Periscope and was just playing some like sad sack music. And I didn't, I hadn't even planned this out at all. I was like, I started eating the cake. I thought it'll just be funny to watch me eat the cake. And I just like <laughs> decided I would start eating it with my hands. And it was just like, this is this sad, just, you know, the classic like person who's depressed, like eating Ben and Jerry's, you know, spoonful. So I was just doing that with the cake and people started tagging layered in it and posting screenshots. And I think he was just so confused. He was just like, what the hell is going on? And he ended up following me and Davis. And of course, Davis, the opportunist that he is, he goes, Hey, you want to go on the podcast? And, uh, <laughs> and he goes, um, he goes, when, when the dolphins win our next game and you know, they had been in a losing streak there. He's like, I'll do the podcast. And so it was the next week, I believe it was just a week later, they beat the Eagles uh, in that big game and Laird had the touchdown. And my notifications on Twitter were just like a slot machine of everyone being so sick. And sure enough, Davis and I followed up with him. He said, yep, sure thing. And, you know, two days later we were, we're doing the podcast and, and yeah, now, now we're buddies, got a regular uh, text thread and, uh, and yeah, it's been fun. I, yeah, I listened to that podcast and it, it was great. It was wild how the whole thing came together. And it's one of those rare instances where I'm fairly certain yourself and Maddox, like by a big margin, have more followers than Laird. Like it's just the athlete that we all know. Like, well, I guess we all knew for that week or so. And it's just sort of like you're more pop, I don't more popular than him, like uh, in this sort of Twitter world, which is kind of sort of strange. And he's just like, who is this person that keeps on mentioning me? And then, uh, yeah, you guys, it, it was a lot of fun. It was it's worth checking out. And I, I have not heard the book club one. Is that do you want to do you want to plug that one out there? You guys all read a book together. So yeah, I we don't we don't have that. to plug Davis's podcast on Roto Grinders Airways. I know that's a, a sensitive subject. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know where it was where it played. I have no idea. Yeah, but, no, uh, no, it was it was on his podcast. It was fun. Yeah, we had he's he does um some reading charities, and you know we knew we wanted to do another podcast. We probably could have just shot the ship. We we're like, oh, why don't we just pick a book um right now and talk about it um it, the timing wasn't great because we had all of the um kind of political unrest and race wars and everything going on when we recorded and it hopefully it didn't come across as um tone deaf or insensitive but he's just a very smart thoughtful guy i mean you hear the phrase like wise beyond his years it's it's absurd how mature he is for his age um and he's he's just a legitimately really good dude and that was another time as well. Like speaking back to like mean tweets, I'm, I'm sure you got some uh, brushback because people were, I remember this whole time because people were dunking on you and just saying like, you know, you're being dis- disingenuous. Is that the word? I feel like that was the word. You're that was, that was one of the hot, that there was, there was someone who said disingenuous and then Silva had one where he goes, I can't believe they were Josh and Laird to the people. So <laughs> those, those will forever be the buzzwords, Josh in and, and disingenuous. How old do you sound when you use the term joshing? I don't know. So it's not that old, but it just seems like such an old timey word. Yeah, it was mid, uh, water jug. It was drink. funny too, because it, it was like, again, you can just, you can just ignore it if it's bothering you. But it was like, people were threatened of like, we're trying to do real DFS analysis and you guys with your bits are hijacking it. The funniest thing was Davis apparently like almost got fired because they're like, all of our subs in chat are asking us, do I actually have to play Patrick Claire this week? <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's also, it's a win-win for you because if he scores a touchdown and he has a big week, like you're the man, you predicted it. That's uh, congratulations. You're awesome. Thank you. And if not, and it blows up in your face and it did the first week, I think he was fine for at least one or two weeks after that. Yeah. It doesn't matter. But uh, the point is, like, it, it was, the whole thing was a bit. And, like, I guarantee you from the start of the Patrick Laird quote-unquote bit to the end of the bit or in the middle of it, you gained more followers. You gained more clout without question. I, I don't know, but I'm going to say that confidently that that no, happened. No, definitely. I, I, I think it was – I was losing followers – during it but i was gaining them at a faster clip uh, but yeah it, it was a it was a funny period uh for for people to get uh so triggered with it and uh yeah i would have dropped it if no one cared but i just had to keep swerving into the skid yeah uh it's just sort of wild how that went down and that, that's kind of sort of how you walk the fine line of like you know with your content you're you're kind of doing a bit and you're also kind of like using some analysis it's a new you know, you, it's up for the listener to figure out which it is, I suppose. Yeah. I <laughs> mean, it works I, perfectly. In my, in my, 
I definitely do some stuff where I give my real opinion. In my perfect world, I would no one would ever remotely think of me as a tout. They would never tail my picks thinking that I have some kind of expertise. I like, you know, I did for Roto Grinders this past year, I would do my bankroll builder shows where I would recap how I was building my lineup and I'd recap it. So I'm always willing to share my process, whatever or how bad that process is, and just show people the things I'm thinking about. And I think I ask the right questions. I think I read the right stuff, but I'm also, I'm not a DFS pro. I'm, I'm learning, I'm trying to get better at stuff. So I don't mind letting people into that. And I'll have my own opinions, but not an opinion that I'll stand by and being like, you should pay me money for this opinion. So um, yeah, I definitely much prefer being a comedy tout as Davis and, and Soccer Dave would say, uh, <laughs> as opposed to a, a real tout. Are, are you a one lineup guy? Or do you, you uh, make it a three lineup guy, 10 lineup guy? And like, how do you decide which one to pick for that, uh, for that series you kind of you run? Yeah, you no, know, I historically had always been um, single entry, three max, you know, just trying not to compete with the MME guys. But this past uh, year, it, even starting with kind of League of Legends and stuff, I've gotten more into mass multi entry. And again, I'm not, I'm not maxing the big stuff. I'll, I'll play the mini max, the 20 maxes, three maxes, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I have enjoyed um, making more lineups, you know, not being like having all my chips in one exposure basket, getting to, to spread it around a little bit and more sweating a portfolio as opposed to an exact set of guys. How did you get so good at TikTok? <laughs> See, I don't, I don't think, uh, I am that I think, well, this was again, Manchin was giving me a hard time about this and, and so do Tuttle and all of those guys. Like my TikToks don't do well on TikTok. Um, but I just like, I like using the kind of the built-in tools to the app. It's like on Twitter, you just got a text box. Sure, you can upload a photo. On TikTok, they have all these songs, all these sound bites, all these things that you can play around with. And so I'm like, oh, this is just a sandbox for content and I'll use it to then post on Twitter. Um, and because I'm kind of making inside jokes for Twitter, uh, they just inevitably do so much better there than they do on TikTok. Yeah, that's uh, my experience on TikTok has been limited, and I, I've jumped on there, and I don't understand the uh, like the concept of it. And I think they just keep firing different videos at you, like it's just like a rapid fire. And I don't know. I gotta sit down one day and try to figure it out, or maybe I should. Should I figure out TikTok or no? Is it not? Is it not for me? You sell it on me. So I will just say, as a as a so a couple things. Um, TikTok can definitely get a, a bad rap in general. There are just lots of teenage girls doing dances. The thing is, is their algorithm is sneaky good, like in a in a big brother, NSA, <laughs> scary way good. So if you start liking stuff that you like, the algorithm quickly pivots <laughs> and you'll start to see really fun stuff. Like there's this guy that I like, he's just this kid that lives in the Midwest. He lives on a barn. And he just d plays sports all day, but he'll like re-engineer equipment for a sport. So he'll have like a hoop on a tractor thing, or he'll be, you know, coming up with drills and stuff. And he just records himself doing all these random sports drills on a farm. I'm like, I love this. So if you train the algorithm to get the content you want, you can push past it. It's just like when people said, uh, you know, Twitter initially is just, you know, a thing for someone to say what they ate for breakfast. It's like, no yeah. one would say that now you create your own experience. So yes, is, is there a lot of that? Sure. But there also is really funny people and people doing really creative stuff on there. So even if you don't want to post, I think getting an account and, um, it's by far the funnest scroll. Like the way it works where you just scroll and see these quick videos, even more so than Twitter, like it's just instant dopamine rushes as you go. So I, I recommend it just as a scroll. It's perfect for our 2020 uh, attention span as well too, right? Just certainly oh, yeah. just kind of fly through so quickly. Uh, what is the key? What's the key to going viral? Because like, I'm sure you've had this experience before where sometimes you think, oh, this is it. This is the one. This is going to go nuts. This is going to blow up. And it gets like five likes or 10 likes or 15 likes or whatever the equivalent of that is on TikTok. And then sometimes you just kind of throw it out there. I'll just throw it out there and see how it does. And I don't think much of it. And then it just completely blows up on you. You ever have that situation where it kind of works both ways, where you don't see it coming and sometimes you're like, well, wait a second. Why, why was this totally ignored? Oh yeah. And it's, it's like, isn't it like that with almost anything in life, the stuff you just want so bad uh, <laughs> will inevitably flop. And it's the things when you just have that carefree, I don't care attitude that then it blows up. I mean, that happens to me a lot. I've just, by pure volume of doing so much content, I've kind of stripped away a lot of those instincts to where I'm not 
as emotionally invested in each individual piece of content. Like before, when I would do one man's video and be like, the only thing I did all week, I would, you know, you tense up and you're like, please do well, please get some likes, please get some comments. Now I'm, I'm just throwing out shit five, six times a day and I can immediately move on. And sure, I have a scale of thinking like, oh, I think this is going to do well um, versus uh, this is a really, really niche joke. It might flop. But I mean, for me, I literally, I try, I try to only make things, I actually think I do a pretty good job of this, only doing things that I think are funny or are interesting. Like I do think I could be good at TikTok on TikTok if I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, but that kind of, some of the things that play really well there just wouldn't be interesting or fun or creative for me to make. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I love all the inside baseball DFS stuff and, and uh, inside jokes. So I don't know. That's, that's what I enjoy doing. So that's what I, what I make. Shoot or shoot. You got that, the J.R. Smith, like Nick Young swaggy uh, sort of mentality. <laughs> uh, you mentioned baseball. I don't, I only know you from football. Like you're also a baseball guy to some degree. No, I, don't know. I I've never, I've actually, I don't even know if I've ever made a okay. an MLB DFS lineup before. Yeah. Do you care about the Red Sox or the Rockies? Do you care about baseball? So I had, uh, growing up, I was a big Rockies fan. I mean, they started in 93 as an expansion team. We had the Blake Street Bombers. So as a kid, you know, Galarraga, uh, you know. Larry Walker. Or, yeah, Larry Walker. Dante we had Bichette. A, Dante Bichette, yep, the big cat, or that's a uh, Galarraga. But yeah, so those guys were fun. Uh, I got into it then. And then I did have a little resurgence when I was in college 2008 when the Rockies made that run to the World Series, Rocktober, where they were just destroying <laughs> souls, but then they ran into the buzzsaw of the Red Sox and got swept. So I did get caught up in it then. I still enjoy, you know, some playoff baseball, uh, some of those playing games, trying to get a wild card spot. That stuff's super fun to me. But um, yeah, I just, um, I guess I am one of those uh, millennials who um, gets a little bored by the game. Uh, and, and don't enjoy it as but much as basketball. Do you care about the, the Celtics, the Nuggets, just the NBA in general? Is that your thing or not so much? So, so I like, I like the NBA. Um, but you know, in general, I don't have fantasy just ruined me from a traditional fandom <laughs> perspective. I'm sure that's the case for so many people. Um, but yeah, I used to be a hardcore Nuggets fan. Uh, especially again, it was, uh, 2009 when they made it to the Western conference finals against Kobe and uh, it seemed like we had a chance. And then they uh, they took us out in Denver in game six. I was at that game. So the funny thing is, is I went to school in San Diego and there were so many Lakers fans and so many Chargers fans that it actually reinvigorated my fandom because I was like, no, I like the Nuggets. I like the Broncos. Um, but once I moved out here and got more into fantasy, I just I stopped caring when the Broncos won the Super Bowl against the Panthers. I was getting all these messages. Oh, congrats. I'm like, I felt nothing. I got to be honest. I felt nothing. <laughs> Are you a mellow truther? You mentioned the, 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 the mellow was in that team, I assume, back in 2009. Yeah, I was never a mellow uh, truther. I mean, I was stoked when we when we drafted him just because, you know, he was kind of the one B with LeBron in that draft. But uh, I was always I was a little bit of a purist where I was like, I didn't appreciate at the time just the pure shooting prowess. And I was like, come on, move the ball. Let's get some other guys involved. I don't want it sticking here on the elbow while you do 19 jab steps. So I was more of a a Chauncey Billups guy, you know, I like my Chris Anderson, some Birdman in there, maybe a little <laughs> Earl Boykin novelty, uh, five foot five guy, never a huge mellow guy. I, you know, I would have laid like 500 to one odds that Earl Boykin would not get a mention in today's pot or the Birdman, 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 uh, Chris Anderson, a, a NBA champion. I believe he was in that one of those heat championship teams. Yeah, he was. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Good for him. I wanted to ask the, uh, the most ridiculous thing you wagered on, but like, I, I'm not sure if you can top it on anything we've already sort of talked about, but uh, is, is there anything that would top we've, something we've, uh, already talked about as far as ridiculous wagers? Yeah. I mean, push-ups, <laughs> push well, no, 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 come on. I was a judge. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't gambling on that. Oh, be... people are very angry at you. You're judging. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, got... the example, he did not repeat the example precisely a hundred percent. So those I'm are some mean tweets. I'm a big believer of like the spirit of the bet. And um, <laughs> we would have all have known if Bales was angle shooting. He was definitely not angle shooting that bet. Um, let's see the most random. I mean, honestly, it's probably some of the broathlon stuff, right? Where this is actually a random story from the beer mile. And this is how be I've gotten better at looking for positive EV bets as opposed to just doing stupid shit for content. But yeah. back then what happened was I thought I was going to win this beer mile with Bales and Levitan. They we hadn't put a ton of money on the whole bro athlon, so they weren't super monetarily incentivized. So they made a side bet on the first lap of the beer mile, 
And they're like, we know we're going to lose to Mans in the full thing. Let's get some side action to make this interesting. Me being dumb, I didn't realize, obviously, they're going to sell out to win the first lap and then yeah. just fade. But I wanted in on the action so bad. So I bet them on the first lap too. Immediately I see they're in dead out sprints. I'm like, I can't do this and do that. And I just torched however a couple hundred bucks just because I wanted to get a bet on the first lap of a beer mile. I think that has to be up there with dumbest stuff I've wagered on. Game theory, man. Game theory. I see. I've gotten better at it. At the time I was just like, oh, this is fun. Let me get some action on this. I, I've kept you for a while. Let me get you out of here on some word association stuff. You mentioned Silva. Uh, I guess you're Silva's replacement uh, on Swolecast. I suppose is that how that worked out? I suppose you are, right? Yeah, I, actually, I think they kicked him to the curb because they knew they had me in the wings. <laughs> how is that how that went down? You're yeah. behind the scenes. Yeah. Who's the Evan Silva guy? Get rid of him. <laughs> Fade. <laughs> yeah. So word association, Evan Silva. <laughs> Evan Silva just joshing around. <laughs> uh, Leone, I know Leone. You've uh, done some podcasts where you guys uh, get a little thirsty yep. together. Leone is an analytical drunk. Uh, uh, Tuttle, let's get back at Tuttle. Tuttle is, um, he's the silent rock. He can convey so much information with so little. <laughs> he doesn't get paid by the word. <laughs> uh, Levitan? Levitan, uh, w- w- what's one of his terms? The the stone nuts. Uh, yeah. I love Levitan. He's, he's all professional on Twitter, uh, but just a super fun, good dude uh, in real life. He, he'll let his hair down, uh, so to speak. He, he's fun. Ram? CSU Ram. I mean, Ram is like, uh, he's the president, right? Like he's the politician. Every, everything comes and goes through him. <laughs> Everyone likes Ram. He's, he's Mr. President. Bales? Bales is, is the beast, the muscle man. Um, it's actually really frustrating that someone that's that sharp and that good at gambling and, and, you know, writing and thinking about things is also has a body where he's just looks like a meathead, but he's actually the entire opposite of that. I don't know him at all, but he seems like a super smart guy. Just follow him on Twitter, basically. Uh, Zero running back? Zero running back. The optimal draft strategy for 2020. (laughs) Uh, Soccer Dave. Soccer Dave. um, He's a teddy bear. You know, he, he, he likes to kind of have a little bite, but at the end of the day, uh, he's, he's a, he's a soft, nice teddy bear. Thought leader? Thought leader. Peter Overs at League of Legends. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, and you can do it whatever voice you want to, uh, Davis Maddock. Davis Maddock. Davis Maddock is, he's, he's all of our little brothers. And, you know, he'll agitate us at times. But at the end of the day, we love him, even if we have to give him a noogie every once in a while. Uh, Peter, I much appreciate your time. I appreciate the, you know, the insight you have on the mans as well, too. Much appreciate you for sharing that. Uh, get out like your thousand socials. Uh, go ahead fire away i'll relax for two minutes i'm not yeah i'm not a good good plug guy um (laughs) twitter you don't have to sign up for tiktok if you want to see my tiktoks because i repost (laughs) them all on twitter eventually i should start doing some exclusives to drive people over there um but yeah the swole cast man that's that's the show we do it every thursday at noon uh always have fun doing that with the crew and uh, i'm i'm stoked that we've been doing it this off season and uh, yeah, I can tell we're all itching to actually have some some more football things to talk about. But the offseason experiment has been a good time. Uh, much appreciate your time. I'm going to hold you to that man's coin, by the way. Don't, that was not just for the air, I hope. Hopefully, we'll, I'll slide into DMs after the show at some point. But I want to get my – I mean, if Head Chopper gets one, come on. Head, head Chopper's got a higher status than me. That's yep. outrageous. DM, DM me your address. We'll hook it up. <laughs> much, much appreciate your time. That's Peter Overzet. I was Dean. This was The Morning Grind. Thanks for listening. We're out of here. Holler.